and today is the second Sunday after Pentecost, Sunday within the Oxford of Corpus Christi. In the in good beer again in Hartford. In the epistle for this Sunday within the Oxford of Corpus Christi, it's taken with first epistle of St. John, chapter 3. Dearly beloved, wonder not if the world hates you. That's okay. We know that we have paused, that we have passed from death to life. Because we love the brethren, he that loveth not abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in himself. In this we have known the charity of God, because he hath laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He that hath the substance of this world and shall see his brother in need, and shall shut up his bowels from him, how doth the charity of God abide in him? And little children, let us not love in word nor in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And then the gospel. It says here, sorry, it's taken that according to St. Luke chapter 14. At that time, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees this parable. A certain man made a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at the hour of the supper to say to them that were invited that they should come, for now all things are ready. And they began all at once to make excuse. And first said to him, I have bought a farm, and I must needs go out and see it. I pray thee, hold me excused. And other said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to try them. I pray thee, hold me excused. And other said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And the servant returning told these things to his lord. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the, fee the poor and the feeble, and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And behold, the Lord said to his servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that, they, that, that my house may be filled. But I say unto thee, unto you, that none of these men that were invited shall taste of my supper. That was by the word in today's Holy Gospel. few considerations. Today is the Sunday within the octave of Corpus Christi, the great feast of the Blessed Sacrament, and a few different considerations of the church and this Sunday within the octave. One is in the scripture reading that we mention often for the day, which is the great battle of the two sons of Heli. And today was the day of the death of Heli and the death of his two sons because of the Blessed Sacrament. And then the Heli, the two sons of Heli, he was a priest of God. He didn't break all the rules. He was not a wicked priest. Heli is a great example of a police officer or a judge uh, or anyone in authority, a priest of God, a bishop or a pope who doesn't do heresy, who doesn't do immorality, who doesn't do wicked things. But God said to Heli he would still punish him. Because Heli did not teach his sons. And Heli did not correct his sons when they were young. And therefore, when the sons became older, they became extremely wicked priests. And they were abusing the people and doing great evil. And though they committed their own sins, Heli did not teach them. Heli did not correct them. And Heli did his own personal duty, but he only did his minimal duty. And therefore, Heli, when Anna came to him and Anna was weeping, he thought that he thought that Anna was drunk and didn't realize she was weeping because she was sorrowful because she had not children. He misdiagnosed the disease of Anna. And they, why? Because he did not spend time with our Lord. Though he did his duty, he just did the minimal of his duty, and he didn't take care of his children. He didn't teach them properly. He didn't correct them in their vices. He didn't take proper care of his flock. He did simply the bare minimums. He was not what we call a wicked priest. And the fathers tell us that God killed him and punished him but they, to show the seriousness of this sin. However, he didn't, he didn't lose his soul, that he went to the fires of purgatory, not the fires of hell. And nonetheless, there are those, are those like Eli, though, who, who, who did a duty less than he, and these would go to the fires of hell. And then there's, the, there's a, 
the, the fact that what the, the two sons of, 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 of Heli, they, Samuel had prophesied that they, three of them would die the same day. The two sons of Heli brought the Ark of the Covenant into the camp to fight against the Philistines. And on the day before, yesterday on Saturday, they fought a battle against the Philistines, and the Jews were, de were defeated, and about two or 3,000 died. But then they went and got the, the Ark of the Covenant and brought it into the camp. And they greatly rejoiced that the Ark of the Covenant was in the camp. And the, the Philistines wondered at the rejoicing, and they knew that the, that the Ark of the Covenant was there. And they said, no one can defeat their God. And everywhere this Ark has been brought into battle by King David, everywhere it's been brought into battle before the time of David, always the Jews have victory and no one can defeat their God. And the Philistines were ready to leave the battlefield. But one stood up and said, it is better for us to die that become subject to the Jews. Let us fight. So the next day the Philistines arose, fully aware that the Ark of the Covenant was more powerful than them, fully aware the Jews had never been defeated whenever they had the Ark of the Covenant, and they went into battle so that they would at least die with honor. And they slaughtered the Jews. And over 20,000 were killed, in the almost entire, and in, amongst them the two sons of, of, of Heli, the two sons of the high priest. And they were slaughtered. And the, and the Philistines had almost no casualties, and they took the Ark of the Covenant into custody. And the church uses this reading for the, for the Mass today to show the seriousness of receiving Holy Communion in the state of mortal sin. Because the two, the, the, the two sons thought, we've got the Blessed Sacrament, we've got the Latin Mass, we've got the, 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 the protection of Christ. Whoever takes Christ and Latin Mass in the battle cannot lose. And right now, the whole, the whole a conservative movement is taking Christ and the Latin Mass into the battle, while they're not taking the faith and charity that goes along with it. And as they go into battle, they say, we cannot lose. And yet, the world continues to get more wicked. The powers of evil continue to grow stronger. And so, the, what's the problem? And here, as you see it in the Mass today, that the Blessed Sacrament is the answer. It is the answer. But the Blessed Sacrament is not the answer by receiving Holy Communion alone. The Blessed Sacrament is not the answer by going to Mass. The Blessed Sacrament is most, so much more than that. Because right now we see in the Church today, and the, and, and the Church today, it's very clear in 2022, that there are more Latin Masses in the world than there ever have been since 1969. 1969, the, the new Old Mass was suppressed. And a few thousand priests in the world stood up and kept it. Now there are many thousands more saying the Mass. And the priests who said the Mass, they said the Mass in garages only, in private houses only, and for little groups here and there all over the world, and were very much despised in small groups everywhere. But now there are larger groups. Now they're saying Mass not only with the small groups who still exist, like our little groups, but there are also the larger groups that exist inside of churches, inside of uh, approved churches, and sometimes massive groups, and they have able to use the old beautiful churches again. And yet the world continues to get worse. The power of the devil continues to grow. And people say, well, the answer is the Blessed Sacrament. The answer is the true Mass. Let's go back to the Blessed Sacrament and the true Mass. And more and more people have the Mass, more and more people have the Blessed Sacrament, and we're going to defeat, defeat the devil. But for, don't forget that in 1968, the Latin Mass was everywhere in the Catholic Church. 100% of the Roman Rite churches had the Latin Mass. And yet the world was worse than it was in 1967. And in 1867, the whole world had the Latin Mass. But each year it got worse. And in the 1940s and 50s, bishops were complaining all over the world. Particularly in the West, the United States and Europe. There have been too many vocations after World War II. We have too many mouths to feed. We got five, six, seven priests in every diocese. The monasteries have twenty in every parish. The monasteries have 40, 50, 60, 70 priests saying the Latin Mass every day. Eucharistic Congresses in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and other places throughout the world where fifty thousand priests are five five thousand priests are saying Mass every single day. And there's always a Latin Mass. So with so many masses and so many holy communions, God must be pleased with us. But the fact is, God was not well pleased. And St. Paul points out that all, my children, I will have you be aware 
that all the Jews passed through the sea, 100%. All are under the cloud in the daytime that protected them from the heat of the sun. All of them followed the fire. All of them ate the same spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual drink. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. One of the great evils of the conservative movement in the church today is that everyone is convinced. I need my Holy Communion. I need my Mass. I need my sacraments. And if I get my Mass, my Holy Communion, my sacraments every day, or as often as possible, at least every week, and if I get my Mass and my sacraments, and my kids get my, the Mass and the sacraments, this is how we're going to defeat the devil. And yet, the church, we see in the church, our Lord Jesus Christ says no. The Blessed Sacrament does defeat the devil, but not in mockery. It defeats the devil not materially, but supernaturally. And hence, there is the presence of Christ. When the body and blood and soul and divinity is physically in the host, the bottom blood of the holy divinity enters into anyone who is baptized when they receive Holy Communion. And they but most receive sacrilegiously, and the supernatural presence of Christ does not enter. The physical presence enters, but the supernatural presence does not. If you die without receiving the physical presence of Christ, you can go to Holy Communion. But if you die without the supernatural presence of Christ, you're damned. We need the supernatural presence of Christ, which is the emanation of his physical presence. And so when our Lord Jesus Christ enters us, and enters us, and enters us, but nothing changes. It's like water flowing through a brook for a thousand years. The water throws through a brook for a thousand years, and there's rocks in the bottom of that brook. And the water goes over the rocks, and over the rocks, and over the rocks. Well, when you pick up a rock that's been in the water for a thousand years, and you break it open, you'll discover it's 100% completely dry. That the years and years of water going over it did not make it become wet. Something else is required. The rock has to change into something like a sponge. The rock has to become porous. When the rock becomes porous, then the water enters. But if the rock does not become porous, the water does not enter, and it does it no good. And here we see the problem in the church today is that many souls receive Christ. Some of them say the mortal sin which is condemned by the church today and, and, and of our Lord Jesus Christ and by St. Paul who received Holy Communion unworthily. Others receive our Lord in the state of grace. They haven't yet committed the mortal sin, but they don't let that grace penetrate and they don't let the presence of Christ be the life of themselves and they don't spread that life because the rule of life is that which is alive spreads itself. Human beings, animals, they grow up and they have children. But there comes a point where you're still alive, but you're beyond the childbearing years. You're still alive, but you can't have children anymore. You're still alive, but you can't work anymore. You can't lift things anymore. You're still alive, but you're getting sick and weak. In other words, you're dying. And one of the signs of the transition between life and death is when you can no longer replenish your strength, when you can no longer give life to others, and this in the supernatural life is infinitely more true. In the physical life, of course, the body is going to decay because that's the way the body is made, plus the problem of original sin. But even without original sin, the body must decay. So there's no problem in the physical life. But in the spiritual life, the soul does not decay. Our mind doesn't decay, our heart doesn't decay, our, our, our decisions don't decay. And therefore, there must be an increase of our strength an increase of the presence of Christ, an increase of the knowledge of Christ, an increase of the desire that Christ be spread. And so this, the presence of Christ is something that came to the earth 2,000 years ago. And even though on Ascension Thursday he ascended into heaven, and the angel came down and said he's going to return into the world in power and majesty. His power and his majesty is still here on earth. It's in the tabernacles throughout the world. It's in the secret places where the Blessed Sacrament is held. It is always there. But remember, there's only one body of Christ. So many thousands of tabernacles have that body. There's not two bodies. Hence, it's not really better to have the tabernacle in 400,000, Christ in 400,000 tabernacles, or to have him in only one. His presence is enough in one host to fill the entire world with grace, to go out from that one host into every soul. So that, and that when there are a thousand hosts, he doesn't have a thousand times more graces. 
is not a thousand times more Christ. And so therefore it is not necessary that there be billions of hosts and millions of hosts. What is necessary is that the one Christ in his mind and heart and spirit and soul enters with his body into us when we receive Holy Communion, into us when we receive Confession, into us when we say our Holy Rosary, into us when we do our works of charity throughout, and our, as well as the fulfillment of our daily duties. As we're going about, there must be the Spirit of Christ in us. And the Spirit is to increase. And notice also, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he speaks of hell, multiple times he speaks of the wedding feast. Heaven and hell, he speaks both cases of the wedding feast. Heaven is the place of those who came to the wedding feast. Now remember about a wedding feast, unlike any other feast, those that are guests don't do much. All they do is show up. All the work is done by the one who calls the, 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 the party. And the celebration is for the bride, and the celebration is secondarily for the groom, and the celebration is for the father of the bride. And this is the, when he is very happy, and he wants to share his joy with all the world. Hence he invites to the guest, to the, to the wedding, or as many as is based upon his love. Since God loves all things in creation, and since God loves all man without any exception, he invites all to the guest, to the wedding. And everyone must come to the wedding. And not only that, when people say, I'm busy, he sends out priests, he sends out bishops, he sends out deacons, he sends out apostles, he sends out holy women. He sends out to the whole world in order that souls might come to the feast. And then he even says at the end, but they all said they're busy, Lord. It's in the epistle today. They all said, the gospel today, they all said they're busy. I pray thee, hold me excused. I've got a wife. I have a farm. And he says, but compel them to come in. Go out. If those who have a wife won't come, then forget them. If those who bought a farm won't come, then forget them. They have been tied down by their farm. Let them take their farm with them into the kingdom of hell. They've been pulled away by their wife. Let them go with their wife to the kingdom of hell. But go out to the highways and hedges and go to the beggars and go to all those and compel them to come in. And here is important also reminding why the church says there are four marks of the church. One holy Catholic apostolic. The church is one holy Catholic apostolic. One, only one God, one truth, one faith, one, one set of sacraments, one sacrifice under one head. Holy, set apart for God. And, and apostolic, Catholic, that all things are set apart for God. But then apostolic is an essential part of the church. And this is a fruit of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Sacrament. The apostolicity of the church is if Jesus Christ is in us, then the heart of Christ must be in us. We read in the Gospel just a few days ago, in one of the Masses just very recently, they said, Lord, they compelled him to stay in the town. We want you to stay and teach us in the land of the Good Samaritan, the lady, the, the, the Samaritan woman. We want you to stay and teach us in another place in Galilee. The Lord said, No, I cannot stay and teach you, for I was sent to others, and I was sent to go and bring the gospel to all the world. I can't stay and teach you. I taught you now, I taught you for a week, now I've got to go on and teach somewhere else. And that this is, the, is part of the Spirit of Christ. So the church says there are not just three marks, which are obvious, one holy and Catholic, but there's a fourth mark also. And this mark of apostolicity comes from Christ's heart. And when he, when he was uh, about to go into heaven, he said, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And I want you to go in, therefore, teach the gospel to all nations. And he didn't make any exceptions to this because of the Spirit of Christ. So if no one's coming to the wedding feast, what do you do? Compel them to come to the wedding feast. And that if the whole world is against the wedding feast, go out and find those who know nothing about weddings and bring them into the wedding feast. But this, where does this spirit come from? It's a part of the driving heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which is why he says, St. Paul, who had that heart more than anyone else, said, Caritas Christi urget nos. The charity of Christ urges us and drives us on. It's a charity of Christ that drives us on. And the Lord oftentimes sends trials he sends difficulties. You say you receive Holy Communion on the tongue. Very beautiful. You receive it the Holy Truly True Mass, and you don't go to the sacrilegious new Mass, and you don't receive sacrilegious communion on the tongue, I mean on the hand, and you don't receive sacrilegious communion at all because you're still in the state of grace, and you made a good confession before going to communion. But that's not why I came. 
Because food is to transfer you and to me. When you eat regular food, says St. Augustine, that food is transferred into us. You eat a vegetable, it becomes part of us. But when we eat the Blessed Sacrament, he's not transformed into us. We are supposed to be transformed into him. And that is why the presence of Christ will begin to manifest itself. If the Blessed Sacrament is truly in me, then it will manifest itself by somehow Christ coming out in my thoughts, Christ in my thoughts because I think about him and talk to him, whether I'm in trouble or I'm having a good day or a bad day, and that I emanate him out to the world. And so the presence of Christ is left behind. The Lord said to his apostles, I'm going to heaven. And he did go to heaven. He didn't lie. But he left out a detail. I am also leaving my body on the earth. I am also leaving my heart on the earth. I am also leaving my spirit on the earth. And I'm also taking it with you everywhere you go. Just forgot to mention that. But he did tell them he's going out through the whole world. And he's going to bring his whole spirit. Hence, he's so much so, but what to be called a priest. He's supposed to be alter Christus, another Christ. That is, he's supposed to be a walking spirit of the Blessed Sacrament. And so much so that the church, God told him, Jesus Christ told the twelve apostles, and he told every priest to the end of the world, including the wicked priests who need to go to confession and have turned against God. He said, I want you to say at the altar, this is my body. And when the priest says, this is my body, and when the priest says, this is my blood, there is no other way for Christ to enter this world. And so the physical body of Christ cannot enter the world unless a priest says, this is my body over bread, and this is my blood over wine from grapes. That's how Christ's physical body comes. How does the spiritual body, how does the spirit of that body, how does the soul of that body enter the world? Only by Catholics who carry that spirit of Christ and say, I want Christ's spirit to be my spirit. And when I say, this is my spirit, this is the problem of Heli. Heli, he, he did his duty, but it wasn't his spirit. Many priests say Mass, but it's not their Mass. Many priests hear confessions and say, Ego te absolvo. I absolve you. I absolve you from your sins. What they mean is, Christ forgives you, but I want to kill you. I won't forgive you, but Christ forgives you. But the only way that Christ can forgive is the priest says, Ego. He must say, I absolve you, then you are forgiven. And so as life travels, we have to take the ego of Christ and the ego of self and slowly put them more and more close together so that there's only one ego, and that's the ego of Christ, the I of Christ. And this is the battle of life. The battle of life is not simply to stay out of sin. The battle of life is not simply to stay away from hell. That's not the battle of life. The battle of life is to make Christ's presence more and more in our hearts more and more in our spirit, in our soul, in our passions, more and more in our flesh, more and more in everything we do and everything we say and everything we are. That's the battle of life. The devil knows that, so he goes through life and he tries to take Christ out of the fingertips and Christ out of the mind and Christ out of the passions and Christ out of our desires, Christ out of every part of us. That's all the devil's doing, trying to chop down trees, cut away branches, and remove Christ. That's it. And in order to fight the devil, we can't just try to have branches not be cut off. We have to regrow them back. We have to regrow them back. Talk to our Lord and have the desire to have the presence of Christ more and more inside of us. He lied. He had the presence of Christ physically. He had the presence of Christ in his duty, but it never was fully in his heart. Phineas and Ophni and Phineas, his two sons, they had the presence of Christ physically, but they didn't have him at all in their hearts, and they burn in hell. And then the saints have the presence of Christ physically, but they also have him deeply in their hearts, so that when they walk about, when they work, when they go, they are the visible manifestation of Christ in their spirit, in their heart, in everything they do. And this is what we have to strive to be. Which our Lord Jesus Christ said, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is, be more like unto me. The servant must be like unto the, the disciple, must be like unto the, uh, uh, unto the master. In any case, we need not just the physical presence of Christ, but that presence enter to every part of our being and spread into everything we do, and we compel all to come to the wedding feast. Who is God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.